Hi, everyone. This is Akiko Fujimoto. I'm the music director of the Mid-Texas Symphony, and this is a virtual pre-concert lecture for our season opening concert this Sunday, September 12th, titled Scheherazade. And today I'm so delighted to be joined by our guest artist for this concert, Jennifer Burke Matthews. Jennifer will be playing the oboe um, in the Marcello uh concerto so we are very excited and she also happens to be our principal oboist um for a long long time so welcome jennifer hi akiko i'm so glad to be here with you it's great. just great to see you in this time so it's great to see you so this is it's been a long time um since we were supposed to do this concerto with you um we had planned it before the pandemic the pandemic happened and then so we postponed it uh to this fall and we're just so glad that we could do it um and this will also be a big return to the stage as a full orchestra for um for us um how has the pandemic been for you and um how does it feel to be playing this after a year um a year after you were supposed to do it well it it feels kind of like finally i guess <laughs> you know i've been looking forward to this for a long time um but you know with the pandemic it just i haven't been we haven't been performing as much and um so i'm just excited to get together with people and make music um because that's something that is just so special to do there's only so much you can um, so much musical fulfillment you can get by yourself in your practice room. So it's it's going to be a lot of fun. That's right. And you did um, a video for us, a mini concert on video um, last fall when we went digital as an organization. Yeah. And that was great. But I think we are just so ready to connect with the audience in person. Um, and uh, we did some socially distanced concerts last spring, which were all great. But we're gonna sit a little closer this time um, to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just gonna be a little closer to what we normally do. So, okay, well, let's talk about the concerto that you are bringing us uh, by Benedetto Marcello. Tell us about it. Yes, and I'm glad you said Benedetto as opposed to Alessandro. Yeah. <laughs> That's always oh, a good well, big fear. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, well, um, there's, two brothers, two Italian brothers who wrote the same concerto. We're not sure who wrote who wrote it first or who even wrote it best, but one is in C minor and one is in D minor. And so um, it's just, it's one of those things you find with oboe players is what team are you on? Are you on T, D, team D minor or T, team C minor? And I've had, I've had very, very wonderful teachers on either side. Okay. But um, one of my most formative teachers John Farilla was a big stickler for the C minor. And so um, when I studied with him a little bit, um, one summer at Tanglewood in high school, he introduced it to me in that key. And then again, he was my graduate school teacher. And so, um, yeah, I just, I, I fell in love with it in that key as much as I love the D minor one. It's the one that I tend to stick to. That's great. Do you mm -hmm. think, uh, sometimes I get questions from patrons like, why are some things in certain keys? Uh, do you think there's a reason why this piece works so well in C minor? Something about the character of it? Well, C, I mean, C in general, I mean, everything's in C. Um, you know, if you're out in the world and you're hearing a ringtone or you're hearing a, a, sometimes even a car horn or you're hearing a jingle on, you know, an ad, I mean, C is everywhere. It's the most prominent key that you'll hear. And if, if you start you know, having having that note in your ear, you'll hear it everywhere. And so right. I think that, you know, having having a piece in C minor, it's just it's just kind of one of those quintessential keys. He actually writes it with two flats, even though C minor is in three. Um, so it's that's kind of one of those quirks of this piece, too. But to be quite honest, C minor is a little clunky on the oboe. I'm not gonna okay. lie, I feel like D minor is actually, it's a little bit more fluid, even though you break into the third octave, which for you non oboe mm -hmm. players, it just means that we kind of restart with our fingerings. And so crossing that barrier can sometimes be a little awkward. So C minor, in C minor, you actually don't do that. C um, is that, again, we're in a, you know, it's that highest note of the range um, for that particular octave. And I know I'm getting very technical um, but no, D is a little bit better on the instrument. And so it's it's kind of, 
you know, you, you get the, you get the pros, you get the cons with both um, keys, just mechanically speaking. But um, yeah, C minor is just a little bit, um, the, I don't know. It's just the, there, there's a different tone that you get with C minor versus D minor and one's not better than the other. It's just, I just love it really honestly, Kiko, it comes down to the second movement, which arrangement do you like better? Um, mm, Cause that's right. And I, I think the second movement, a lot of people probably know it, even though they don't know that they know it. I mean, it's so iconic. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's, let's break down each movement. I mean, how would you describe each movement? Uh, with a big emphasis on the second, but yeah. The f well, the first movement is just kind of, it's very straightforward. Um, and it just kind of marches along and um, has a lot of poise to it. And so, right. you know, you, you kind of get a stateliness of this introduction that's very simple. Um, I agree. I you want to say stately. That's a, that's a great description of that mm -hmm. opening. Yeah. Uh, I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm I'm telling you all my characters now, so you'll know uh, this weekend. I'll be ready. Um, yeah. But then the second movement oh. just has this sweet and yet very somber and painful um, mm -hmm. sense to it, which is you know probably accented by the fact uh, or accentuated by the fact that there's just not a whole lot of room to breathe, and so I look like I'm in pain too. So I think that that. That might help the character there a little bit, but oh, basically <laughs> the struggle is real. You yeah. know, there's a there's a lot Definitely. of I, whenever I look at oboists, I feel like they're gonna combust. You know, yep. that they're gonna blow up because there's so much pressure, air pressure inside of them. Um, but we are the beneficiaries of the beautiful sounds that come out of that. You know, pre air pressure. But I mean, let's talk about that. I'm sure the oboe is an extremely difficult instrument to master, um, but are there specific things, I mean, besides read, read making and all that stuff, like about the actual playing of that instrument that's unique to the oboe that you find challenging? Yes, and so I will actually challenge anyone watching with this, which is that, so the oboe is unique because our mouthpiece, the double read, it's just, it's so teeny tiny, it's kind of like, the distance, sorry, the mirror, <laughs> the mirroring effect here. It's it's almost just, you know, like between my two fingernails is what I'm blowing through. And so there's okay. no way you can ever blow all of that air that you take in to support the uh, support your notes, to, to support what you're doing. You can never blow all of it out through the instrument. So when I'm running out of air, it's not because I don't have air in my lungs. I actually have a ton of air still left in my lungs. It's that mm -hmm. I don't have any fresh air. And so unlike pretty much any other instrument you see, we actually have to breathe out before we can breathe in. And so there's moments in this concerto where I actually exclusively breathe out. And then even though I've breathed out, I keep playing with just the, that residual air that's left in your lungs. And then I'll breathe in uh, maybe wow. a bar later. And so if you see me breathing back to back and it's like she just took a breath, it's probably because I just huffed out and then I breathed in a fresh, uh, some fresh air right after that. And so, um, you know, it's just one of those kind of quirks. And then you see that in the second movement where it's just, okay, I just, I need fresh air in my lungs. And the only way to do that is to breathe out. And so it, it's one of those things you have to train yourself to do because when you need more air, normally you just breathe in. And so with students, mm -hmm. I have to train them like breathe out, breathe out, breathe out. Cause otherwise, you know, if you just go, <laughs> you're going to suffocate. So um, it's just, it's kind of, that's, that's the biggest quirk I would say. Wow. I didn't even think about that. So it sounds like you have to do a lot of planning of your yeah. phrases and where your breaths are. Your breath. And um, it, and oboists also have gorgeous, sometimes very long substantial solos in the orchestral repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, you are almost always a soloist, although you do play with, the woodwind section or as you know oboe section and as part of the whole thing and um is it weird to step out of that and play a concerto concerto or are, do you think oboists are so used to being soloists already in the orchestra that it's kind of a natural extension no i mean we're a member of the section so we're used to collaborating and so sometimes the biggest thing that i have to remind myself is that i'm the soloist and i need to stop following everyone else 
And so mm. um, collaborating and, you know, and, and being a team player, it's, you know, when yeah. you're, when you're solos, it's kind of like being the conductor. It's like, you have to take charge and say, no, this is how we're doing it. Um, and so that's the big difference between stepping into the orchestra and stepping out is really just right. owning the stage and making sure that, you know, I'm not compromising so that I'm not compromising where my breaths are going to be if we're going too slow or too fast or anything like that. So, right. um, you know, that's, that's the biggest difference. Now, we have a guest oboist to play the principal part um, in the rest of the concert, so you can focus on this concerto. Um, but I think a lot of people are probably dying to know why we tune orchestras to the oboe at the beginning of every concert. Do you have an answer to that? Or is this so mm -hmm. obvious or such a tradition that it's not worth going there? Oh, it's always worth going there, Akiko. I mean, yes, it is tradition. It's tradition. So, you know, back in the, well, let's go back to the beginning of the orchestra. So it used to just be strings. And so, of course, that's why the concertmaster stands up and tunes the orchestra. If there was harpsichord with the orchestra, then, you know, that keyed instrument that is a fixed pitch, that's where you get your pitch because they can't move. Same thing with right. oboe. The only way that we can tune our instrument is by scraping on the reed. Um, or clipping it shorter to make it sharper. So scraping generally makes it flatter, clipping sharper. I can't sit there in the orchestra. I mean, not that, you know, I haven't tried, you know, adjusting the tuning of my read. I'm supposed to come in with it in right. tune. Yeah, and, right. and we don't adjust. The, if you were to take, you know, the middle part of the instrument apart, you actually, your bridge keys, the keys that connect across the, the joints wouldn't connect. Mm -hmm. And then you're, when you pressed a key, nothing would happen. So we can't do that. Um, that's just not part of that's just not an option for us adjusting like that and so um yeah so so the orchestra tends to tune to the oboe because we have a fixed pitch instrument so that's Very good. there's a reason for everything yep i just now, like to be special so <laughs> <laughs> now um you're you happen to be from san antonio originally mm -hmm. um and then you came after all the schooling, you came back, um, won an audition with the San Antonio Symphony, and yep. you were a member, a full-time member for a while. Um, and now you are a director of development uh, in the Air Force Village's Charitable Foundation. Yeah. Uh, while you're still a principal oboist with the Mid Texas Symphony, so tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what you do as a director of development there. So I have a really wonderful job with them. Um, we we're formerly Air Force Village, and um, so that's why we're the Air Force Village's Charitable Foundation. But basically, I like to tell people that I get to share really great news with people or scare them away. Um, that's because I'm there. I, I fundraise. And so I, I'm, a, I'm a fundraiser and um, get the opportunity to help, you know, submit grant proposals and um, develop major gifts, you know, state, state giving, all that sort of thing. Um, and then also, you know, help put on events and for the organization and, um, but basically what we do is we just, we take care of retirees, both Air Force and non-Air Force, our, our residents that are living there. So um, it's a really great mission and cause. And, you know, we've got Alzheimer's care and research that we do on campus. And so it's very, very diverse in what I'm doing every day. And um, just, I don't know, it's a real treat um, to, to be able to be the director of that foundation. That's fantastic. Now, um has San Antonio changed a lot since you were a kid um, here uh, and then you came back here as an adult? Um, has it changed a lot? And or I mean, you've changed a lot, obviously, in the meantime. So tell me what happened in the meantime after you left San Antonio? Where did you go? And then when you came back, how did you find the area? Um, when I left, or I say when I was growing up, you know, the loop was Loop 410 <laughs> and 1604 was more of a farm road. And so it's kind of yeah. interesting to come back and all of a sudden the Pearl was just opening and, right. um, you know, having the city really, really reaching not just to, but beyond 1604. And, right. um, you know, and that's actually where I'm working is just outside 1604 at this wonderful um, retirement village in the hill country. So, um you know, it's it's a totally it's a totally different city in the fact that it's so much bigger, but it still feels mm -hmm. like a small town. Um, yeah. So the, the random yeah. person you meet and it's like, oh, I knew your grandmother. And it's like, oh, that's random. So um, it's just how that's it is great. here. That's great. Um, and where did you go in between? Uh, where did you study? 
the oboe? I went to Indiana University specifically for oboe. They've got a mm -hmm. great program there at the Jacobs School of Music. It's it's a really large place. But I went there for the teacher, Linda Stroman, mm -hmm. and had the wonderful opportunity to also study a little bit with Roger Rowe, who's the English horn player in the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was nice, to, nice to be able to study with both of them. He's actually from Texas, so he kind of got you know where oh. I was coming from. Yeah. And then um, for grad school, I went to New England Conservatory in Boston and did my master's and an extra graduate diploma there with John Furla of the Boston Symphony. And so he's the one I was talking about earlier that loves the C minor concerto. And um, so that was, it was nice to be able to do that with him. That's fabulous. And uh, for those of us who are not oboists, you know, how big of a shock is it to go from oboe to English horn and back to the oboe in in a, one sitting or one concert, sometimes you have to do both. Um, how different is it for the player? Between the two instruments? Mm -hmm. um, well, I've heard people, I think rightly say it's it's kind of like going from violin to viola. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. in common, right. but um, it's, it's a bigger instrument. So you need more air. I tend to expend more air, um, unlike the oboe. I still have to breathe out, but not quite as much. Um, and then, just, I mean, that's the biggest thing, just a little less less embouchure, um, wider vibrato, bigger air. You just have to approach it like it it is a bigger instrument than it is because, you know, we as oboists tend to, when you're new to English horn, you tend to kind of undershoot how, how much different it is really from mm -hmm. your primary instrument. But no, English horn's great. I love it. Um, I, I'm a huge fan. You're great, you're great at it. I mean, <laughs> well, I knew you as a ho English horn player in the San Antonio Symphony. And I mean, you're such a beautiful player on that instrument as well as on the oboe. It, it's more, it's a little bit more natural to me, I would say. I, I think I picked it up um, just the way that I tend to play and breathe and everything. It It's a yeah. little bit more natural to me, which is why I fell into that position yeah. as an English horn player. Um, but you know, they're, they're both great. And my English horn playing makes, I think my oboe playing better and my oboe playing makes my English horn playing better. So it, they're a nice, yeah. you know, they're very, they're very good together. And I'm sure the reverse is not necessarily true for every oboist and not every oboist enjoys playing the English horn or is good at it. That's very true. And there are some people where the English horn actually playing English horn, um, I don't know, makes, makes their oboe playing a little bit, uh, harder. Like it, for some reason they don't gel. And so those are the people that, you know, it's better for them to just stick with oboe. But for me, it really enhanced my oboe playing and vice versa. And so yeah. that's when I knew it. it's like, I, I, I knew pretty early on that, you know, I, I could probably fall into an English horn job, but I was, I was encouraged strongly by my um, teacher at Indiana to really make sure that my oboe playing was, wow. um, was was very solid she said you know that's the fundamentals that's you know you need to you need that and that actually has served me better than almost any other advice as far as oboe playing goes so you know if you want to do an auxiliary instrument and you're listening to this make sure that your primary instrument is you know just just as solid because um it's important to know both that's fabulous advice um now i i was so i got i went down the rabbit hole um of the breathing and all that stuff in the second movement. So I interrupted you from talking about the third movement or the whole concerto. Is there anything you want to say about the third movement? The third movement. I mean, the third movement is just fun. You know, I think when I was, when I was a kid learning it for the first time, I was going, Oh no, it's all the fast stuff. But like now that I'm playing it, it's actually, it's just very jovial. And um, especially after that second movement, it's just kind of a breath of fresh air. And um, there's a lot of play between the oboe and the strings, you know, like I play something and then the strings kind of carry it and then vice versa. And um, just a lot of back and forth. So it's, it's a little bit more conversational, I'd say, especially after this giant monologue in the second movement. So that's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Second so movement monologue. Yeah. Yeah. But the outer movements are very much a conversation with the orchestra, mm -hmm. um, strings of the orchestra. Um, great. Fantastic. So I think we have a lot of things to look forward to in this concerto uh, on Sunday the 12th. Uh, it's going to be right in the middle of the program. So mm -hmm. we will have the audience and the orchestra will have both warmed up by then <laughs> with the yeah. Finlandia and then... Um, We'll be all ready to 
put 100% of our attention on you and your wonderful concerto. So we're really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for joining me, Jennifer. Is there any parting words you want to say to the audience? I'm just glad we're finally having this concert. <laughs> <laughs> Long overdue, a year overdue. Yeah. And so really yeah. glad we can put on a concert like this. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you so much for joining me and uh, we will see you this Sunday. All right. Well, I will leave you to it. I know you've got uh, more to talk about. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Bye. So that was Jennifer Burke Matthews, um, who will be our soloist for the Marcello Oboe Concerto this Sunday. Um, as Jennifer said, I did want to talk about the other two pieces of this program. Um, the first piece, as I mentioned, is Sibelius Finlandia. Um, for those of you who are new to this piece, uh, this is about an eight minute piece, uh, probably one of the most beloved pieces by this composer um, who is really who has really become synonymous with the country of Finland. Um, and I think you can kind of say that this is almost an unofficial national anthem of Finland. And there's a good reason for that, aside from it being a great piece. Uh, and that's the origin of the composition. Uh, when uh, Sibelius wrote it, uh, Finland was still part of the Russian Empire. And uh, he wrote it for a public event um, that was a celebration of spring, you know, something very innocuous, but it was really to rally people's spirits uh, to work toward the independence of Finland as a country. Um, so he really wrote it to give people of Finland courage and pride. And there, it's an outstanding piece that accomplishes both of those sentiments immensely. It opens very dark and ominous with a brass chorale, uh, very um, almost sinister sounding. And that's because this is the portion of the piece where he is describing the Finnish people's struggle against the Russians. And eventually the music breaks into a dark march, um, fast paced and still kind of ominous, but it is a march, kind of militaristic. And then it gives way to the same rhythm of the march, but in a major key. And uh, suddenly the march becomes a joyful, uh, triumphant march. And we, you know, those of us listening are thinking, what's going on? Um, and it grows in excitement um, and uh, just great energy accumulating. And then it bursts forth um, into a, a very calm, serene section of the piece that I think will be very familiar to many people. And that this is when he introduces the tune um, that made Finlandia so famous. It sounds like a hymn. There are no words to the original composition, even though later it became so popular that Sibelius extracted this hymn section. Um, there were words added and now it's known as a Finlandia hymn, but at the time it was part of this instrumental composition. Um, and um, I bet all of us can hum it, even if we didn't know that it was from the piece Finlandia. Um, it is played by various different sections of the orchestra, just very calmly, quietly, um, but it is later combined with the march um, and uh, it shows uh, that the people of Finland have uh, triumphed um, through music, uh, literally. And that dark, somber, aggressive march that we heard uh, in the second section um, is just uh, very happy now. And um, it goes to a very, very climactic ending. And at the very end, uh, you will hear the Finlandia hymn tune spread over a very grandiose uh, chorale um, by the brass section. And uh, so you'll hear it one more time. Um, so it is an extremely well-paced, well-crafted piece, uh, about eight minute piece, as I said. And um, we chose this um, 
partially because we were truly looking forward to returning to the stage as a full orchestra. Um, many of you know that we performed in person last spring, several concerts, but with reduced forces, the chamber orchestra or chamber ensembles and with limited in-person audience. Um, and that was all very, very exciting uh, at the time, but we really missed our audience and each other, you know, as a full orchestra. So we wanted to play this for you to open our new season. Um, hopefully what is to be, um, our exit from the pandemic um, and uh, kind of this is a big group hug um, for both us and the audience. Um, so that will be very exciting. Um, after the intermission, uh, after Jennifer's concerto and the intermission, we will play a very virtuosic tour de force piece called Scheherazade. This is by Rimsky Korsakov, uh, the great Russian composer and um, Rimsky Korsakov was not only a great composer, but he was an amazing orchestrator. Um, he knew how to combine instruments of the orchestra in such a way that it created the best effect. And he knew how to use inst each instrument to its greatest advantage, you know, strength, and to how to combine them to create new colors. And speaking of colors, he had a condition, um, I think synesthesia, uh, where he associates colors um, with sounds. Um, so he was very attuned, his senses, all his senses were very attuned to the colors of different instruments in the orchestra. And he even wrote a treatise on orchestration. Um, and uh, from what I understand, it's not just about each instrument's range and quarks uh, and the mechanics, but it's also about the combinations, the different colors that um, combinations of instruments create. So he knew the orchestra as an instrument intimately and he knew how to use it. And, you know, I can't think of another piece that showcases each section of the orchestra so well. Um, it is like almost a concerto for the orchestra. Everybody has big tunes or solo moments. Uh, they come in and out and there are some really important, amazing uh, individual solos as well as section solos. Okay, so enough about how good of an orchestrator and uh, master of the orchestra Rimsky Korsakov was. Let's talk about Scheherazade itself. So um, as the title suggests, um, this is based on Arabian Nights or 1001 Nights. And Scheherazade is the sto uh, story's heroine. Um, there was an evil sultan, um, a king, who hated women. And to get back at women, he would marry a different one each night and kill them. Um, and the person that stopped this behavior was Scheherazade. She was very brave. Um, she went to marry him and to keep his interest and keep him from killing her, he, she told a different story for 1001 nights to him that were all so amazing and enticing that he kept her alive and he kept listening to her. So this was somebody of immense intellect and courage. Um, and Rimsky Korsakov assigns a specific instrument to Scheherazade, um, or shall I say a theme, um, but for Scheherazade, it's uh, not just a theme of Scheherazade, but also a specific instrument, and that's the violin. The solo violin played by the concert master, uh, our concert master is Craig Sorgi, uh, plays the voice of Scheherazade throughout the piece, and her theme is interwoven through her different stories. We also have a specific theme assigned to the Sultan and that opens the entire piece in the first movement. It's a very ominous, um, actually, I guess we chose two pieces that start very ominously, um, but you'll hear the low brass um, kind of um, reaching really low and deep and uh, blaring out the Sultan's theme. Now, if you're at the concert, Remember the Sultan's theme at the very beginning because it also closes the, the piece after about 45 minutes. Now, obviously, the Rimsky Korsakov couldn't have written 
a different piece for each of the 1001 nights because he would have run out of time or the concert would have been too long. So he chose four stories uh, that Scheherazade told and he created a movement of music uh, for each of the four stories. Um, first one is a, about Sinbad the sailor. Uh, he was the voyager of the seven seas and um, he goes on various adventures on the sea and you can hear the waves, da, 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 this arpeggio in the um, low strings um, happening throughout the movement. Um, and you'll hear solo instruments, um, solo horns, solo flutes, uh, various soloists kind of floating on top of the waves um, as if it's Sinbad, the sailor himself, um, kind of looking out at the sea on a calm day. But most of the piece is not calm. It's it's the waves are crashing. Um, they're very wild. They get very high and tall and loud. And it's a very exciting, evocative movement. Um, it ends soft, though. So I think his um, adventures concluded on a peaceful note. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very exciting movement. Um, the second movement um, is about a prince who, um, through a series of unfortunate events, had to go into hiding. He was a prince of a very powerful king, um, and the king was killed by his enemies, and his enemies were going to next go after the prince. So he had to go into hiding. So what he did was he shaved, he cut his hair off, he ripped his clothes off and pretended to be a calendar or a holy man who um, takes the oath of poverty. So um, very, very poor but holy person um, that, you know, prays and um, stands at, at the gate of the city gate begging for food and um, things, but still a very holy person, a uh, mystical figure. And uh, as he's standing at the city gate, he runs into, or a couple of other calendars uh, find him and they say, hey, what's going on? So the three of them get together and they go on various adventures. And that's what this movement is about. Now, this movement is very, very interesting. Um, of course, we begin with Scheherazade saying, once upon a time, uh, played by the concert master. And then uh, we have a very forlorn, sad sounding um, bassoon solo, um, kind of lamenting. Um, and uh, this lament is followed by several other instruments, including the oboe. And then suddenly um, we have something that sounds like an interruption. And the trombone, the second trombone announces something that sounds like an arrival Yum, ba -dum, ba -da -da -dum, ba -dum. and so you know something's gonna happen so as you can tell this second movement is chopped up into different movements but all connected and we play it all at once connected with no interruption but it is in different chunks and uh, from then on you will hear all this adventurous music marches um and something that sounds like fife and drum and uh there is a section in the middle where the whole orchestra stops and the string orchestra, uh, they play pizzicato, which means plucked, instead of you know playing arco with their bows. And they do this series of dum bum 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 bum. They just vamp on pizzicato, and above that, a clarinet solo plays something that sounds like a snake charmer, uh, if I may say so. Uh, something that sounds like someone is t twirling um, round and round. And I've heard that this is a reference to a whirling dervish, um, somebody you know, who whose ceremony um, requires them to go round and round um, to pray and to reach a sort of a level of enlightenment. So we could be witnessing musically a whirling dervish spinning around and round. Um, but it's a very virtuosic solo from the principal clarinetist. Um, and very exciting. Um, and we go back and forth on these adventures and the rolling dervish music. Um, and at the end, um, 
it ends on a somber note, but very powerful, uh, showing that Prince Kalandar, you know, he probably succeeded in staying safe and fleeing from his enemies and hiding his identity. But life as a um, Kalandar is not easy, uh, not like being a prince. Um, so it ends on a very sharp, um, decisive note. From here, we go to the third movement, and this is a love story. This is sort of the de facto slow movement of this piece, four movement piece. Um, you know, Sherazade is kind of like a symphony, four movement symphony. So this is kind of a slow movement. Um, it's the love story between a prince and princess um, who were geographically challenged. Uh, one was in Persia and the other was in China. And they were also challenged by their parents in that their parents told them that they have to marry who is chosen for them, that they cannot marry for love, you know, somebody that they chose. So these two individuals separately defy their parents. Uh, they're locked up by their parents uh, for not, you know, for defying them, but they stick to their guns and say, I am not going to marry who you pick. So what are we going to do? Well, for some magical reason, this is why fairy tales are fantastic. They meet, but they meet each other in a dream. So the first half of this piece is incredibly dreamy, a very sensuous, romantic um, piece. You know, the theme is first played by the violins, both violin sections, one and two. So all 20 players playing this beautiful, lush, melody um it's really gorgeous music and serene um and dreamy just uh overall and uh it of course goes through some trials and tribulations um but it ends on this sweet note and uh in the middle we have something that sounds like a wedding press procession because they do meet and they do get married how? Well, apparently the princess's butler, faithful butler, um, felt so bad for her that he goes on a worldwide um, hunt for her dream prince. And uh, after three years, he hears about a prince who is pining for a princess that he saw in a dream locked up in a tower in Persia. So through some amazing connections, he finds this tower he helps the prince escape the tower and together they go to China to so that he can meet this princess. And of course they get married um, and have this wonderful wedding reception or a wedding procession. I'm sorry, I don't know if there was a reception, but maybe there was, I'm sure there was. Um, and with the blessings of um, the parents, um, and I really like this wedding part in the middle of the third movement because uh, there are all these light, soft percussion instruments like the triangle. And uh, it sounds like the marriage of two cultures, not just two people, but you know, per, um, Middle Eastern and also Asian, you know, Chinese music. And of course, this is all through the eyes and ears of Rimsky Korsakov, who was so good at imitating music from other countries, as seen by his Capucho Espanol um, and things, uh, he was so good at impressions of uh, music music from other cultures. But I I think um, this is a genius amalgamation of uh, what he thought of as Arabian and um, Chinese music. So that was the third movement, um, and. Uh, not sure if they lived happily ever after. I know they got married happily. Um, I read one version of the story where it said that they faced some difficulties after they were happily married. Um, but that's for another piece and that's for another movement. Now we come to the final movement of Scheherazade, uh, fourth and final. Uh, and this is titled Festival of Baghdad, and it's actually a series of events and uh, adventures. Um, you will hear a very sped up version of the Sultan's theme at the beginning. So the Sultan and Shahrazad, even though they, this, these four movements are about 
some fictional characters and adventures, their music never completely leaves us. They keep popping in and out. And here at the top of the fourth moment, his theme comes up again, uh, but in a very fast kind of patient way. It's almost like he's saying, come on, do one more story. Um, and then Scheherazade chimes in, but instead of the dreamy version of her um, theme from the beginning earlier in the piece, this is a very harsh um, and again, fed up version of it. Um, you can tell she is gaining strength and she's very assertive um, and she is about to open the final and the best story uh, of the 1001 stories that she's told so far. Um, this festival of Baghdad um, actually involves more Prince calendars, uh, kind of like in the second movement. Um, there are three sisters who throw a banquet and the three calendar princes stop by um, and the sisters say, well, you have to tell us a story from your adventures. So they do. And the main bulk of the piece is uh, about the story of that this third calendar tells the sisters um, at this festival in Baghdad. And um, it is very fast paced uh, music. Um, he also had voyages on the sea. Uh, he's a commander of a fleet of ships. Um, and he tells a story of a uh, shipwreck that he experienced. Um, and on the island, deserted island where he wound up after the ship wrecked, there was a um, mountain, a black mountain that's magnetic. Uh, and um, so the ship, the pieces of the ship all get you know, stuck to it. Uh, it's very dramatic. Um, Rimsky-Korsakov's music doesn't go it doesn't describe the story at all. Um, but what it does do, I mean, it has the general ambiance, but it's not describing the, how, what happens to this um, a shipwreck, you know, word for word at all. Instead, it chronicles music from the first three movements. It's kind of a summary of what we've heard so far still uh, in this fast paced uh, new tempo of the last movement. But if you listen carefully, you'll recognize some themes. It's just in a different tempo. From, and then it's all strung together like a medley uh, of reminiscences from uh, the first three movements. So it, it's very, it's a very fast paced, concise summary. Uh, the music also gets extremely virtuosic. Every section of the orchestra has to play extremely fast um, stuff uh very challenging to keep together and the music keeps even the tempo stays the same the music inside the tempo keeps changing so it's very um challenging for the orchestra and very very exciting now suddenly all this fast-paced music just comes to a complete halt with no preparation and when the orchestra comes back in uh you know that we are re going toward a big climax. Um, it's very exciting music. Music starts to sound more and more dangerous. Um, and then it builds and builds and builds. And then it breaks open into the ocean theme, the wave theme from the first movement. Um, and so we're brought back to the opening music and think, oh, wow, we are finally concluding this adventure but not so fast, not so easy. Rimsky Korsakov does ride in an actual shipwreck um, when the ship hits a big rock um, into the music. And you will know because it's a huge splash and a collision and a gong uh, in the percussion section, or as we call it, tam-tam, will be uh, rung. Uh, so you will hear this big wash of explosion and um, orchestra gets quiet and everything subsides. So it's a very, very dramatic moment. One of my favorite moments in symphonic music. Um, after that, um, we go to, back to the peaceful music that concluded the first movement. Um, it feels like everything's gonna be all right. Um, and Scheherazade makes one more appearance with the concert master solo. 
And so you wonder, oh, what does she have to say like now after everything that we've experienced? Well, when she's done, the orchestra goes into this kind of coda, this uh, ending. And if you listen carefully, you will hear the Sultan's theme underneath everybody else in the cello and bass section. It's the same music that we heard blared by the brass at the beginning, but now these soft low string instruments are playing his theme as if everything has changed. His relationship to Sherazad has changed. Obviously he's fallen in love with her. Um, he's realized that she is an amazing woman and uh, he has, in a musical way, um, subjugated himself under her spell. And it is a beautiful musical depiction of that. Um, it doesn't last long, that ending. So I hope you catch it and I hope you enjoy it. It is one of the most poignant moments um, in the history of music, I think. And the whole last movement ends with um, music that opened, uh, these woodwind chords that opened, uh, helped open the first uh, movement. And I'm getting very emotional thinking about it because I think that tells you that the story has concluded. Scheherazade has succeeded in her mission and survived, more than survived. Uh, she and the Sultan fell in love with each other, um, all as well. And uh, you end with this music that sounds like once upon a time, one last time, because this is a story it's fiction. And we heard, we've been hearing these fictional stories within Scheherazade's story, within the story called Arabian Nights or 1001 Stories. Um, but the question that um, Rimsky Korsakov leaves us with is what's truth and what's fiction? Were Scheherazade and the Sultan just the two players um, that had this? Um, conflict at the beginning and then, you know, made peace at the end. No, not necessarily. They were actually having their, this was their own adventure. The story of Sherazada was a big adventure in itself. And it was just as exciting and important as these uh, sailors and princes and princesses uh, stories. Um, and that I think the message that I get from the ending that Rimsky Korsakov gave us so beautifully is all of our stories are reflected in other people's stories. Um, and life is uh, fiction, but fiction is also life. So I love this piece so much, if you can't tell. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy seeing our Mid Texas Symphony uh, play it so beautifully. So thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope to see you there in person on Sunday. This concert is not live streamed. So we hope we'll see you at the Jackson Auditorium at the Texas Lutheran University in Seguin uh, this Sunday at four o'clock. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>